Welcome to my video on JThreads in C++. In this video, I'll teach you all the cool features of JThread and I compare that with STD Thread. You will learn how to create JThreads and write programs using JThreads and I'll show you why it's a safer, cleaner and smarter option than STD Thread. Moreover, I will talk about concepts such as stop token, structured shutdown and cooperative cancelling between two threads. So let's dive in. Hello everyone, I'm back with one more video on C++ multi-threading. Today I will talk about JThreads and I really hope you guys will enjoy this video. If you found it useful, please go ahead and subscribe to my channel, like the video and share it with your friends. Alright, let's get started. Let's take a moment to understand the evolution of C++ multi-threading. In 2011, the fundamental multi-threading constructs were introduced, such as std thread, mutexes, conditional variables, atomic variables, and other ones. Most of these I have covered in my previous videos. 2014 and 2017 were mostly some minor updates, but C++20 added some new cool features, and today we are focusing on JThread and stop token in particular. Let's see what is JThread and what does it provide? Here's a classic pattern of creating threads in C++. You have a launcher function and you use std thread constructor to pass a worker function to the thread. And once this thread is constructed, the worker function is running. And then you call t.join and the control gets blocked until the worker is done and then you can exit. Notice that this is the classic std thread from C++11 and every time you create a thread, you have to either call join or detach on it. So as a summary, std thread should be destructed with either join or detach. If you don't do this, std terminate will be called and your program gets terminated. Now, I don't know about you, but I'd rather ending my program myself in a predicted way rather than having it terminated by std terminate. Here is another example. I have this launcher thread which calls a worker. It creates an std thread. It passes the worker function to it. And notice that this t is inside these curly braces. Now, once we exit from these curly braces, t goes out of scope. And as a result, even if you wanted to do t.join later in your program, because t is terminated and destructed, you will not be able to call t.join and as a result of that, std terminate will be called again and will stop your program. So the moral of this is that when it comes to std thread, you have to be extremely careful to either call join or detach on it explicitly. Here's another example where things can go wrong. You have a launcher thread, you call, you, you create a new thread with a worker function. You have every intention to call t.join. However, due to an, due to an exception, your launcher thread exits. And even if you catch and handle this exception, because T will be destructed outside of this function, you can never join on this and your program again will be terminated by SD terminate. So if you're using the classic SD thread, you have to make sure you put some extra effort to handle the exceptions and call join on your threads so that SD terminate is not called for your program. And this is not always ideal. This is a summary of the workflow with classic vanilla std thread. You create the thread, you run the thread function, you, you call join manually, and then the thread joins. std jthread improved this. You create the thread using std jthread, you call your worker function, and you run. your worker function runs in a separate thread, but the join happens automatically on destruction. Let's see how that works in this example. So here is my launcher. And notice that now I create my thread using jthread instead of std thread. Now, once I go out of this curly braces, t will be terminated, but jthread will call t.join automatically in its destructor. So we don't have to call it explicitly. So this program will be fine std terminate will not be called, the thread will be joined correctly, and everything will go fine. And this is done by something called RAII. Remember, RAII in C++ stands for resource acquisition is initialization. The way it works is that when, it, when you have a resource, when you create an object, that resource that corresponds to that object gets acquired automatically as part of the constructor. Now you work with your object, you do whatever you want with that resource. And then your object exits the scope, destructor is called, and as a result of the destructor running, your resource is released. In short, resources are tied to the object lifetime. The object 
is constructed, your resource is acquired. The object is distracted, your resource is released. Another example for this is SD lock guard, which we have seen in my previous video, where you lock as soon as you construct this lock guard. And as soon as we go outside of this scope, you unlock. Other examples are unique pointer or shared pointers or IF stream in C++. These are all following our AII and provide the convenience of releasing the resource. Now, going back to JThread, exactly the same thing happens here. As a result of T being distracted, join will be called here. So at this point, we have peace of mind that SC terminate is not called and we can do whatever we wanted. Let's go back to the exception problem. If you define your thread as a JThread now, even if an exception happens, we exit from this function, T gets distracted, join now will be called automatically. So SC terminate is not called. And if you handle this exception outside, your program can keep running. Now let's see a larger example. In my previous videos for multi-threading, I showed you an example where we calculate the sum of a range of the numbers by splitting this range into multiple threads and each thread calculates a partial sum. And then at the end, we add up all these partial sums together to get the total sum of this range. In order to implement this using jthreads, we first create a worker function. The, the, the important part in the worker function is actually this line at the end. All the worker function does is to calculate the start and end of its chunk. And then we use the fancy fold left function from SD ranges to calculate the partial sum and store it inside partial sum vector with the thread index. That's all we do here. The launcher thread launches a bunch of those worker functions. So each worker basically calculates the sum of all of these values in, in its own chunk and puts the result in the partial sum with the thread ID. The interesting part is here where we create a vector of J threads now and each thread is put inside the threads vector. And notice that once we go out of scope, all of these threads will be joined because our threads uh, vector will be distracted. That means all of these elements will be distracted. That means every thread will be joined. So in the end, I can call SD reduce to calculate the total sum of my partial sums and return that value. So the main advantage that we saw here is that we are not worried about joining all these threads. In summary, SDDJ thread is joined automatically. This provides safer alternative to SDD thread. But this is not the entire story. SDDJ thread actually provides one more feature, which is called the stop token. And this is actually very cool. So hear me out. Remember that in C++, you cannot forcefully stop a thread. If the thread is blocked, you're stuck unless the thread cooperates. So if I have a launcher that launches a thread, a worker thread, if this thread is blocked, there's no way for me to stop this thread. I cannot forcefully stop this thread. The thread has to cooperate. That means it has to get unblocked somehow and then exit so that it gets terminated. And that is a big inconvenience in C++. Here's an example. In my main, I launch a classic SD thread and I pass my worker function to it, but I want to somehow notify my worker function to stop. Notice that I have a while loop that keeps reading this atomic variable stop flag. And as long as this is false, it does some work and it iterates or loops here. So in main, I launch the thread using, using classic SCD thread. I wait for one second and then I set the stop flag to true to indicate to the worker that, hey, you should stop now and exit. And then I call t.join which in this case, eventually the worker will exit because we set this flag to one. As long as inside do work, we are not blocked. So this is fine and it would work, but there are several things that are wrong with this. First of all, we should manually manage the lifetime of this atomic Boolean variable. So secondly, this is a busy waiting loop and we keep pulling this flag, which is not efficient for the CPU. And finally, what if we are blocked here? If do work is blocked, even if you change this value, the while loop will never go back to check stop flag and you get stuck here. So this T join will never join. So in this pattern, you have to make sure this is not blocked on top of other problems that we have here. Jthread slightly improves this. Here is an example with Jthread. My worker now receives a parameter called stop token, SCD stop token. And instead of an atomic variable, now I wait on this stop token until stop is requested. As long as stop is not requested, I loop here and do some work, but once it's requested, I exit. In my main, I create my thread using jthread. Notice I'm not passing the stop token to my worker thread. It's passed automatically. And that's the beauty of jthread. We don't have to manage that atomic variable that you saw before. 
as a result of creating JThread, a stop token is passed automatically and I can just use it. So now I wait for one second and then I call request stop instead of setting an atomic variable and hopefully this worker will exit. So the convenience that is provided here is saving us from creating one atomic variable and managing it ourselves. You're probably thinking, hey Ari, this is still polling and it's not efficient. And I agree with you. So the convenience that we have here is the fact that this variable is passed to us automatically and we got rid of one atomic variable. And instead of using an atomic variable, we just use the thread itself and call request stop. It's kind of like an atomic variable is tied into this J thread itself. So we don't have to create a new one. And you're right, the polling problem still exists. Before discussing how the polling problem is resolved, let's review std j threads destructor one more time. Inside destructor of std j thread, not only join is called, but also request stop is called. So even if you don't call request stop explicitly, as a result of t being destructed, it will be called and then join is called. So here's another convenience that you can have. You don't have to call this if you don't want to. The destructor calls request stop and join together. Now let's go back to this polling problem. In order to see how this is solved, let's first see how this is solved in classic C++ with std threads, not std j thread. So this shows a classic producer consumer in C++ using thread. And for a consumer, we have this loop, but because we don't want the consumer to, to do busy polling, we have a conditional variable and we wait on this con conditional variable until new data arrives. So this data ready flag that is set by the producer is used for us to make the consumer sleep. I talk about conditional variables in details, so you may want to watch that video before continuing to understand how conditional variables work. Anyways, the consumer works in the following way. It loops until done flag becomes true. It sleeps until data is ready. It gets blocked until either data is ready or we are done. And if data is ready, it consumes the data and it sets the data ready flag to false. And notice that we lock on a mutex. So using the shared variable here between consumer and the between the consumer and the producer is okay. Inside my main function, I launch the producer thread. I wait for two seconds and then I join them. If everything goes well, the producer loops for five times. Each time it waits for some time, it makes the data ready and it notifies the consumer to wake up. Data is ready, consume the data. And this process gets repeated five times. In the end, in the final iteration, the producer not only se uh, sets the data ready flag to true, it also sets the done flag to true. It notifies the consumer, the consumer wakes up and it sees that, hey, data is ready. It, it consumes the data. And then in the next iteration, it says done is also ready. So it exits. So everything works fine. Notice that we are using classic STD thread and consumer now is not doing busy waiting. So this is some progress. The problem, however, happens here. What if before calling notify one, the producer exits due to an exception or something else happens and we cannot call notify one. In this case, the producer exits so the producer can join. But if the consumer is waiting, because this notify one never arrives, the consumer will be blocked forever. Your program will never terminate and it gets stuck. So that's a problem. You have to put some more work here if you're using classic SCD thread, but SCD J thread can solve this problem in a more convenient way. Let's see how that works. This shows the same example with J thread now. The producer didn't change at all. My main function, now I'm using J thread for my consumer and producer. Notice that I don't have join anymore because, because I'm using J thread now, but notice that in consumer, I actually receive the stop token and as part of the conditions for my conditional variable, I sleep until stop is requested or data is ready. So once we wake up using uh, by this notify one, once we wake up, if stop is requested, we just exit. Otherwise, if data is ready, we process the data and then we loop again and we get blocked again. So far, everything is kind of like before. However, what if now we have an exception and this notify one cannot get executed? SDJ thread provides one alternative path for calling notify one, namely called the stop callback. So inside the consumer, I can create something called std stop callback, which is just a function that is called whenever stop token is called. Notice that stop token in this example is called at the end of this scope, at the end of main, 
the consumer thread goes out of scope inside the destructor not only join is called but also request stop is called so we are telling this thread hey you should stop now if we are waiting here and we are blocked we would miss that because this thread is blocked like before we only wake up if a notify one arrives and if something is corrupted here and notify one doesn't arrive inside this callback you can write an alternative notify one on the same conditional variable that is here and this thread can now wake up itself so the workflow would be as follows main ends consumer goes out of scope stop token is requested as a result stop callback is requested notify one is called so even if this notify one was not called for any reason this one will be called so the thread will wake up it sees that stop is requested and you can exit normally here so this is very nice very convenient and what you should take away is to understand stop token what stop token is and what kind of convenience it provides also remember that the stop token a stop callback is also provided for these kind of applications when a thread that is blocked wants to wake up itself i did tell you stop token is cool didn't i now before i let you go let's quickly review a common pitfall with svj thread let's go to my previous example of calculating the sum of a range of numbers here i create a vector of tokens and i pass my worker function to each token and i push them back or and place them back inside the threads vector if you're not careful you might think mistakenly that after this for loop it's safe to call std reduce to, to calculate the total sum using these partial sums but this will not work because these threads are not joined yet when you call std reduce here but they join at the end of this function then they go out of scope so you would be using the result of these threads when they're not joined yet and that is an incorrect usage what you should really do and what we did previously was to put this whole for loop inside these curly braces so that at the end of this now the threads are all joined and now it's safe to use its result this is a very common pitfall so make sure you always use the result of threads once they are out of scope and have joined here's a summary and comparison of stdj thread versus std thread stdj thread provides auto join on scope exit it provides RAII safety and it provides cooperative stop and with stop token in a very cool way and convenient way and it's available in C++20. I put all the examples in this video in this repo. Please feel free to download and experiment with the examples. Thank you everyone for watching this video. I hope you found it useful. If that's the case, please give it a like, share it with your friends and also subscribe to my channel so that you get notified as soon as I release a new video. Thank you and I see you next time.